Live so that when your children think of fairness, caring, and integrity, they think of you. This is my guiding principle every day as I enter my workplace. To become a butterfly, a caterpillar first releases enzymes that dissolves all of its tissues, essentially digesting itself. All that's left at the end of the digestive process are a group of highly organized cells called discs. Those discs become the body parts of a butterfly. Like the caterpillar, you already have what you need to transform your workplace into a place where every employee feels supported to be their best self. Now, it may not be a pretty process, similar to that visual of a caterpillar digesting itself, but like the disc the caterpillar leaves behind, you already have the raw material you need within you to transform your workplace into something extraordinary, like a butterfly. When you hear the word bully, you probably picture that kid that picked on other kids, called other kids names, stole lunch money. You know that kid? Well, similar characteristics exist in adults in the workplace, yet there are no federal level American laws that specifically speak to workplace bullying. Now, to be clear, we do have 30 states and two territories that have introduced healthy workplace bills, but none of those have been fully adopted into law. And at the federal level, we do have anti-harassment and anti-discrimination laws that provide some protections for certain groups of Americans. But the challenge we face is that much of the behavior that would be classified as bullying rarely ever rises to the level of what our laws would consider illegal harassment. What is bullying? My favorite definition is the characterization by one international workplace bullying expert who says that workplace bullying is a psychological power imbalance that can be equated to domestic violence. Now that's some pretty heavy stuff. Given that there are no federal level laws that address bullying in the workplace, we have to rely on people, our colleagues, ourselves, to make the choice to be better humans. And how exactly do we do that? From my perspective, the answer lies within every person in this room. We have to have the courage to be different, to go against the grain, to lead. Peter G. Northhouse defines ethical leadership as a process, a process by which a good person rightly influences others to accomplish a common good, to make the world better and more humane. So if you can accept that leadership is a process, and a process can be learned, then you can accept that you can choose to lead differently within your span of influence with respect to workplace bullying. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission refers to bullying as general harassment to make a differentiation between illegal harassment and just a plain old lack of civility. They found that there are two ways to address harassment in the workplace. The first is to evoke a change in company culture. The second is to focus on civility. In fact, they say that it's on all of us to be a part of the fight to stop workplace harassment. We cannot choose to become place and bystanders and expect our workplaces to change themselves. And if we are going to offer training, that training should focus on respect and civility in the workplace, not just a focus on eliminating illegal harassment. In other words, the EEOC is imploring companies not just to focus on meeting the minimum legal requirement of providing training or creating policies to address harassment, but move to a higher level of morality and take a true look at the lack of civility in the workplace. Several years ago, I was an HR manager reporting to a chief HR officer. 
I got this job after being a stay-at-home mom for two years with my oldest child. The first week on the job, I was given an assignment by my boss, and as I worked through the assignment, I thought I should stop and check in with her and see if I'm even on track to meet her expectations. In a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her, I gave her a hard copy of a rough draft of a spreadsheet that I created, and she proceeded to take out a red pen, start drawing X's across my work, and sigh, and murmur so many unflattering comments about me behind, beneath her breast. So as the meeting progressed, I decided to just say, could you just tell me from scratch what exactly it is that you want because clearly I've missed the mark. Her response to me was to take that hard copy of that spreadsheet, that rough draft I'd given her, throw it at me and say, what do I want? What do I want? I want data I can use. I left that meeting and I cried in the bathroom. I wasn't sure in that moment if it was me or if it was her. I mean, come on, let's face it. I just spent two years doing nothing but talking about poopy diapers and setting up play dates and talking about nursing. Was it possible that maybe I forgot how to be the competent professional that I used to be? That was the first of many incidents. Her berating, her sabotage of my work, her defamation of my character went on for years. As the HR manager that handled employee relations, I was the one that people came to if they had an issue of this magnitude with their colleague or boss or union representative. But who did I have to turn to? Who exactly does HR go to when HR is being bullied? Finally, three years later, I reported her to the CEO. Lots happened following that report, none of which ended her employment or even caused her to have a demotion. At least not immediately, that came years after I left. But what I learned in that experience is that I wasn't the first, nor would I be the last body in her trail of terror. Was that bullying? It was for me. Let's fast forward some years later where I was the HR director, also reporting to a chief HR officer, so similar setup. And after a few months on the job, I found out that some of my colleagues on my same team had secretly taken pictures of my body parts during a work event where I guess in their opinion, my clothes were ill-fitting. The week that I found out this took place, I chose to confide in a colleague about my anger, my disgust, and my disappointment that at this stage in my career, I was dealing with behaviors I would expect from middle school children. By the end of that week, I found out that the colleague I chose to confide in also knew about the pictures, when they were taken, and chose to do nothing. Her inaction actually hurt more than finding out about the malicious actions of others. In this experience, my colleague chose the role of bystander. That word bystander, it implies passivity. It implies helplessness. When you choose the role of bystander, you give yourself an excuse for not acting. You are not a bystander at all when you choose not to act. You are a reinforcer. You reinforce for the bully that their behavior is welcome and you allow, through your inaction, a toxic workplace culture to prevail. James McGregor Burns says that transformational leaders cause their followers to raise one another to higher levels of morality and motivation. Everybody in this room can personify the four eyes of transformational leadership. Because remember, leadership is a process, and a process can be learned. A transformational leader has idealized influence. They lead by example. They are role models. A transformational leader has intellectual stimulation. 
This means they challenge assumptions. They don't just do stuff because everybody's doing it or do things because it's the way it's always been done. They challenge those assumptions and ask for ideas without criticism. A transformational leader has individualized consideration. They recognize and understand that every individual has individual needs, unique needs. A transformational leader has inspirational motivation. They inspire a sense of purpose in a group. You can be that transformational leader if you choose to be. You can personify the four eyes of idealized influence, intellectual simulation, individualized consideration, and inspirational motivation if you choose to do so. You can actually become this transformational leader and personify these attributes and end workplace bullying and impact your company culture if you choose to do so. The EEOC says that workplace culture has the greatest impact on allowing harassment to flourish or conversely in preventing harassment. And remember, in this report, the EEOC is talking about both general harassment, bullying, and illegal harassment. Workplace bullying is one of those equal opportunity sports. Everybody does it, sadly. Of the individuals who've reported being bullies, uh, be, having been bullies, 46% are women, 54% are men. So it's pretty equal numbers. Bullying is prevalent amongst coworkers and colleagues, and it's been found to be one of the most impactful, deviant actions that affect a worker's personal health and work experience. In both of my personal examples, you may see both as bullying, you may say one is bullying and the other is not, or you may say, I don't really know why she's making such a big deal out of either of them. Neither one of those are bullying. Fair enough. However, the physical and psychological impact on me as a person supports my stance that I was bullied because the focus has to be on the impact to the victim, not the intent of the perpetrator. Two eyes. It's about the impact, not the intent. Anywhere from 38% to 90% of American workers have reported being bullied at work. Those workers spend 52% of their day talking about it. Just think about the immense impact on productivity because of bullying. In an article published in the American Journal of Public Health, bullying has been linked to suicidal ideation. People actually sit around and think about how, when, and where to kill themselves because the bullying is so bad at their jobs. In one research study, those workers who've reported being bullied, 80% of them also reported suffering from anxiety, 52% from panic attacks, 49% from depression, and 30% from post-traumatic stress disorder. With the understanding that bullying is so pervasive, yet often not even illegal, will you make the choice today to lead differently within your span of influence with respect to workplace bullying? Have you observed bullying in your workplace and chosen the role of reinforcer? Maybe you now realize that you may, in fact, have been the bully. Don't wait until a coworker commits suicide or sinks so deep into clinical depression they can't find their way out before you act. Sheryl Sandberg, Chief Operating Officer of Facebook, says that leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. My question for you today is, are you living your life so that when your children think of fairness, caring, and integrity, they think of you? Selah. Pause. Reflect.